Hi. In the 19th century, medical technology and pharmaceuticals were developing at an incredible rate. At the beginning of the century, herbal remedies and traditional cures were in heavy use. But by the dawning of the 20th century, the main street pharmacies selling modern medicines had become the standard across the Western world. In the process of modernization, many types of medicine were produced that either had no medicinal value at all, or could be potentially harmful. Looking into these drugs, it becomes more of a study of marketing and the placebo effect more than anything else. They are normally sold as secret recipes, so the consumer had absolutely no idea what went into them. Archaeologists recover the containers that once held these concoctions from 19th century sites, and looking into their contents and how they were advertised can be quite fun and thought-provoking. At the time, though, many of these medicines were being marketed to cure diseases that were a real threat to people's lives, offering false hope just to make a quick buck. The 19th century saw epidemics of cholera, smallpox, typhus, typhoid, scarlet fever, yellow fever, tuberculosis, and influenza, and none of these medicines did a thing to stop them. Here I'll present some examples and look into what was claimed in their marketing, and what was actually in them. I'll start with Holloway's. Thomas Holloway was a chemist with very limited medical training, who called himself Professor, and openly hated doctors, lawyers, and the clergy. He produced both pills and ointment, which were sold around the world starting in 1837. His headquarters was in London, but he also had an agent in New York. The success of these products was incredible. I've found a Holloway's ointment jar in the trench of a Maori gunfighter bar. In Australia and New Zealand, where supplies of official coinage were limited in the 19th century, Holloway and other traders had their own coins minted. Trade tokens replacing pennies and halfpennies with his head on the coin instead of Queen Victoria's. Holloway's pills claimed to cure everything from asthma to gout, sore throats to worms. Truly, they were miraculous. In 1871, an article was published in the American Journal of Pharmacy by Dr. G.C. Wittstein that listed the ingredients in said pills. They were a mixture of aloe, myrrh, and saffron. Unlikely to do much harm, and not much good either. Holloway's ointment claimed to cure everything from mosquito bites to tumours, sore nipples to bad legs. Not bad for a mixture of olive oil, lard, and wax. It was marketed heavily, and marketing was really Holloway's great skill. He became a millionaire in the 1860s, and by the time of his death in 1883, he spent £50,000 a year on advertising. His business survived him, and he was bought out by his rival, Beecham's Pills, in 1930. He used his wealth to found two institutions in Britain, the Holloway Sanatorium in Surrey, and the Royal Holloway College, also in Surrey, which is part of the University of London. Angier's Petroleum Emulsion was a cure-all created by the Angier Chemical Company of Boston, and was primarily refined petroleum, um, or gasoline if you prefer, with a little acacia gum and glycerin. And yes, you're expected to drink the stuff. It was marketed as a laxative, but also as a cough syrup, lung healer, digestive aid, bone strengthener, and muscle builder. Um, it was also heavily advertised to be given to children. Studies in 1884 showed that petroleum had absolutely no nutritional value, uh, but it would remain on sale well into the 20th century. Someone who was given it as a child in the 1950s described it as having the consistency of paint and stuck to the roof of your mouth. Mmm... Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup. It sounds like such a wholesome medicine, and it was marketed to mothers to give their infants when teething, and also as a cure for diarrhoea. It was created by the chemists Jeremiah Curtis and Benjamin Perkins of Bangor, Maine, in 1845. Unlike the previous two concoctions, Mrs. Winslow's worked, and for good reason. It was a mixture of morphine and alcohol, so it should be no surprise that it relieves pain and causes constipation. However, dosing an infant with morphine and alcohol to get him to stop crying could hardly be called good parenting practice. 
Mrs. Winslow's was denounced by the American Medical Association in 1911, but continued to be sold until 1930. Now, much of the normal medicine of the 19th century consisted of forms of opium and or alcohol, and there can be no arguments that morphine is a fantastic painkiller. Dr. John McMunn, in the mid-1830s, developed his Elixir of Opium, which he claimed gave benefits of morphine without any of its downsides. It promised no sickness of the stomach, nor any derangement of the constitution or general health. It was supposedly denarcotized, and therefore safer than laudanum. For that reason, it was prescribed by doctors and advertised in medical journals. When the recipe finally came to light in 1864, it was seen that the opium had just been treated with sulfuric ether to remove the narcotine and the opium odour, which supposedly made the product safe. Unsurprisingly, it did not. One woman related the tale of having taken the elixir for 31 years for pain, she had lost 16 newborns to the congenital effects. Dr. Williams' pink pills for pale people are a cure-all we can blame Canada for. They were manufactured by George Fulford of Brockville, Ontario. The pills, nominally iron pills for anemia, also claim to cure a myriad of other things, such as rheumatism, paralysis, headaches, and even influenza. The British Medical Association published a book in 1909 debunking the various patent medicines available at the time and listing their ingredients. About the pink pills, they write, The pills were ovoid in shape and coated with sugar, coloured pink. After removal of the coating, they have an average weight of three grains. Analysis shows them to contain ferrous sulphate, potassium carbonate, magnesia, powdered licorice, and sugar. They estimated the cost to manufacture 30 pills was one-tenth of a penny, while they were being sold at two shillings nine pence for 30 in pharmacies. So the pink pills did at least have an iron supplement in them, albeit in such a low dose it wouldn't do much good. Sarsaparilla was a very popular drink in 19th century America. Old Dr. Jacob Townsend's American Sarsaparilla, having London offices, was marketed well beyond. I've excavated fragments of these bottles from sites around New Zealand. It was promoted as a blood purifier, curing everything from sore eyes to rheumatism liver complaints to blotches and eruptions on the skin, including leprosy. When chemically analysed by the British Medical Association, it was found that it contained water, sugar, licorice, sarsaparilla, sassafras, guaycum wood, and miserium. Nothing of any real medical value was found, but it's still a popular soft drink today, much in the same way as Coke and Pepsi began as medicinal drinks. Here's a bottle that once held Udolpho Wolf's Aromatic Schnapps. Udolpho Wolf was an American importer of medicinal gin, made in Schiedam in the Netherlands. He marketed the schnapps worldwide and very successfully. But he was not marketing it as an alcoholic drink, oh no. This was a medicinal cordial with remarkable curative properties. It claimed to cure gout, flatulence, kidney and bladder problems, and digestive issues, amongst other things. In terms of ingredients, it was almost pure gin, with juniper berry juice added, not the same as the fruity schnapps that we all know today. I suspect it was added to tonic water with a slice of lemon or lime for that uh, extra health benefit. Mm. Like every other medicine in this video, the success was in the marketing. Wolf's snaps were sold in vast quantities all around the world, and by the 1870s he was selling over a million bottles of aromatic schnapps a year. Sticking in the realms of alcoholic drinks that were meant to be good for you, Vin Mariani was a tonic wine, invented by the French chemist Angelo Mariani in 1863. By combining red Bordeaux wine with ground-up coca leaves, the cocaine in which would be extracted by the alcohol, you get a cocaine-laced alcoholic drink. A drink that was claimed to cure everything, from depression to stomach upsets, or to tone and strengthen up your system. The recommended dose was two to three glassfuls a day, or half that for children. It was marketed ruthlessly, with numerous celebrity endorsements, including Ulysses S. Grant, Queen Victoria, and Pope Leo XIII. 
Of interest, prior to inventing Coca-Cola, Colonel John Pemberton produced a French wine Coca Nerve Tonic, only developing the non-alcoholic version we know today when Atlanta and Fulton County passed prohibition laws. I hope you get the general impression that these medicines might as well have been sold by snake oil merchants. Speaking of snake oil, this bottle once contained a concoction called Dr. Thomas's Electric Oil. That's electric, not eclectic or electric. It claimed to cure toothaches in five minutes, earaches in two minutes, and deafness in two days. It was recommended for both internal and external use. It was invented by Dr. S. N. Thomas of Phelps, New York, and is a mixture of turpentine, camphor, tar, red thyme, and fish oil. Thompson also licensed his product, and it was made in Canada by Northrop and Lyman. Again, this product was extremely successfully marketed, and even survived the Canadian government crackdown on patent medicines in 1908, still producing the product until the end of World War II. This has just been a small selection of the numerous patent medicines produced in the 19th century. Now, what are the lessons we can learn from this? It's not a message that we can't trust Western medicine. Far from it. It was the scientific institutions that debunked the medical quackery of the time and put an end to these products using strict government regulations. It was the creation of vaccines and overall better understanding of diseases that allowed a vast overall improvement in health that we experience today. People wasted their money on these cures and potentially put their and their family's health at risk because they trusted and believed the marketing these companies were putting out, filling newspapers around the world with their nonsense. If there's a lesson to be learned, it's not to automatically trust what you see in the media. To approach the media with a measure of healthy scepticism. And if something seems too good to be true, probably is. Thanks for watching, and please like, comment, and subscribe. Cheers.